I want to talk a little bit about language, because we're talking about Shakespeare, who is, for me, the only world playwright, and every culture takes him on, and it's extraordinary. Yeah. And his his primary conduit, it is narrative and story, he writes wonderful stories, but it's the language. What is it about that language that has such endless power, it seems? Well, of course, it's what it's saying to us, how it, how it reveals to us through the use of words, ex- the experience that all humanity goes through, and the crises in, that, in those experiences of life. I think it's <clears throat> Shakespeare writes when you hit a crisis, knee jerk reactions. It's not considered, this is what they say on the spur of the moment. That's what comes out of their mouths. It's his perception of humanity, his perception of how people react is incredible the more and more you, you study him. And the language, I think when he was writing, the majority of the population didn't were, lit, were literate. There was a great passion to hear things. And there was no television or movies or anything like that at that time. But to replace them was a great deal of reading aloud in halls and churches and going there to hear people read what you couldn't decipher yourself. I think that, that the period in which Shakespeare wrote was a period when our language was being new minted. A lot of what we say is Shakespeare. We don't know it, but it's become part of us. And uh, I often wonder, if that's the case, what the hell he did with illiterate actors who couldn't read the script. Right. And I've tried experiments with the difference between learning by rote and learning by heart. Learning by heart, which is Shakespeare's own phrase, I think means learning by experience. So if you get an actor and you say the experience is, and you describe, they they can't read the scene, but you you read the scene to them, and you say these words are there to describe the feeling at that point. And they, they hear this read over, and they gradually remember it by heart, by experience and then you try and produce it. I've never done it with a Shakespeare text, but I did have tried to do it with the help of a friend with T.S. Eliot. And it really was very fascinating that you could, but my God, the patience you need to go through that process. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when I talk to people like John Barton, who uh, used to be my, was my assistant when I did Merchant of Venice at Stratford with, Paul, with um, O'Toole, uh, he says, I, I, I think they could all re- read, he, but he won't face it as a possibility that they were uh, illiterate. The actors could be illiterate. D- discounted it. But he was very, but John Barton, let me just p- p- pay him a tribute, because I thought with him, it, he really taught me trust. I had never known how to trust a text as, a, as much as I do now. And what do you mean exactly by trust a text? First of all, don't fiddle with it. You don't understand that bit. Just let it ha- let it lie. Let it lie. It'll come to you. Trust it, and it'll breathe. If you say, well, "Let's cut it," and I, it's too, let, give it a, t- a chance, and it pays off. I can't tell you how much. And also, if you trust trust the, the writing of a scene, you will find it has strengths you didn't know, because you give it a chance to breathe on its own without a preconceived idea being put off on it, which excludes the text itself, right. speaking for itself. I haven't explained that very well, but he taught me just that. And, and where the thoughts change, and you know, to, to, to think this is much more delicate material than I'd ever realized. Just to think that you know, it really is delicate stuff. You mean the quality of the thought of the writing, the, line? the thought, and, and the rhythm of the conversation, and so on. And sometimes people will just go into dribbling, say, because they're in a state of, of panic about something, and it just don't take the punctuation seriously. Punctuation is there to guide your, inter- well, just trying to get the sense of it. But when you're speaking, and you go through certain experiences, and you want to utter your response, sometimes the, you will utter them in the, as fast as you possibly can. I mean, I come out in a torrent of words. How could you put commas and apostrophes and, and so on in, in, into that? Forget that. Feel free when you when you found where you're going with the part to abandon uh, the the um, punctuation. So where do we go now? In that 
we live in a very visual age now, 2008. This is a very visual age for younger, young people. And you're talking about an oral culture where the sound of words, the feeling of words, the thoughts of words, the experiencing words is very interesting and fulfilling. But that's not the culture now. The culture is the picture, the video game, the film, the television, the iPod. It's watching, watching, watching. It's not speaking. So what do we do? What do you do with students in Juilliard in New York who are brought up visually and you try to... Well, you, you talk to them. You could talk to the students I've been working with here. They love, they love this author. They've, they've been introduced to this author and they've been given a sense of contact. That may not be enough. To, I mean, I don't know the answer to your, to your remark. It's very challenging. I don't know the future. Uh, I wouldn't presume to say, Stratford's got to do this. Uh, I had my moment of being able to say that, and I did what I felt, and I, I, and I think it was often, maybe by just good luck, the right choice to make. But uh, I love the subject. I pass that on to others. I pass it on to my grandchildren. And uh, um, I just hope there will be enough people to care about it to <laughs> look after it. But well, that's that, there's, there's McAniff's uh, job now. Well, as you said, Shakespeare himself said 500 years in the sonnets. It's been 444. Maybe so the time's up. There's 56 perhaps to go. <laughs> it's a frightening thought. Because well, he did disappear, did he not, in the... Oh, in the, in the, in the, uh, 18th, in the 18th century, century. 18th century, rewrite and all that. Yes. But he did disappear in a way. Yeah. And people rewrote him and didn't like him and didn't understand well, him. They didn't rewrite the sonnets. No. He said that about the sonnets. He didn't say it about his plays. But I presume he thinks, uh, he says it's about the love affair, his love affair for this boy, uh, which he then, you know, he, he declares in the sonnets it was not a sexual uh, affair. On the other hand, he may not be writing about himself, may not be autobiographical, it may be about a man, but I think that affair must have developed into physical a physical affair before it was over, anyway. Mm -hmm. But that's just... Uh, now you've also you've worked in in three different cultures. You worked in the British culture, in the Canadian culture, and the American culture. What are the differences that you see? I think the American culture is much more dominated by um, film and, mu and, and mu musicals than the Canadian culture. And Canadian culture is still young enough. I'm talking about English-speaking culture, not the French. We haven't talked about the French and English. No, we must. Um, but uh, I, I, I feel that's what I feel about Stratford, that there is an opportunity for Stratford to be utterly, totally independent of anything else except itself and its author. And to go, that's the only advice I'd give. You know, just don't try and imitate that and imitate this. Find your own belief in what you've got as your heart, which is a, the best author that ever wrote. Forget other th considerations of that. Find out what that means. If you can't reach that, if you don't get turned on by that, quit. Get out of the way. Give it to someone who does get turned on by that. Uh, that sounds very sort of... No, I'd like to set up a meeting with the board of Stratford and have you say that to them. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the, they've got the best thing they could possess. An open field to do, to do this on and uh, no, no real competition. Uh, and I had things during my time here from the leading American critic, uh, uh, Brooks Atkinson. He wasn't a great critic, but he was a great lover of the theatre, and he had fantastic taste. And after he retired, he wrote me a letter about Love's Labour's Lost, and he said, you know, I've always loved the theatre, but that was the first time I've ever been persuaded that actors are golden people. Whatever that means to you, it means that something that that person, he, Brooks Atkinson, needs was represented by something on the stage, a way of playing humanity, a way of showing love or showing hate, whatever it was, and to respect the actor. You know, as a golden person who can do that to you while you're there. Yeah. Uh, no, an actor, c when it works, can take you a place that you've never, ever been in your life and you may never see again, and I don't know how that happens. Hmm. 
but it's been done to me, and I remember it for the rest of my life. I mean, it's why I do the profession. Yeah. However silly but and stupid it seems at you, times. You, you talked earlier, Robert, about uh, losing confidence. Uh, the, the most sort of humiliating experience I've had uh, when I was very young, and I, and I hadn't done any, anything. Um, uh, I, just, I had done something in the West End of London, but it was the first time I was asked to do, go and do something at Stratford-on-Avon, uh, a production of Julius Caesar with John Gilgood as Cassius. Now, John Gilgood was going through a very difficult patch in terms of his career. Larry Olivier was uh, topping of the bill everywhere, and he was in a very uh, nervous state. And I was co-directing with Tony Quayle. And there came a point, and I was, you know, young and callow, and that, and I'd say things, maybe say too much, because I was con trying to contribute to it. And uh, John eventually said, I can't stand it with that boy in, in, the, in the rehearsal. We have to get rid of him. And so uh, I stayed. I was still in charge of the forum scenes and other things, which, but uh, Tony Quayle said, you know, this is a situation. I don't know how we fit. John's very nervous. And so I was sacked from that. I never told my wife. I was so ashamed that I, you know, made it wrong, done it wrong. I made it thrown away a big chance by being too, you know, too big mouth or nonsense. And uh, so the play opened, and it was it, it did all right. But uh, after it had opened, John, I said he wanted to see me, and I went to see him. He said, I, "I've been a real pig to you, I know, but you have to understand that I've been so terrified of this, and I want you to have this present." And and uh, you know we've been good friends ever since. But that was a whole. It was a, a a real chastening. Don't take advantage of the fact you've been asked to be a director. That it gives you a power and everything, or you have a right to speak whenever you choose. I don't know mm -hmm. what it was. But it 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 was a long time before I confessed to anybody what had happened, and it, and it was, I guess, fairly obvious to the company. But they were very supportive. You know, in the forums, you know, they, they knew. Something had happened, right, right. Uh, which helped me.